Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Geek Nation, How Indian Science is Taking Over the World by Angela Saini. So I've really been enjoying reading Angela Saini of late. Um, as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll show my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. I don't really know which one to read, so we'll go with both of these. I want to know why so many millions of Indians are in the thrall of science, how they are pursuing their passions, and what new technologies they're creating. I want to figure out if this is a real scientific revolution, but what started this whole journey was something much more personal. My dad worked as a chemical engineer in India in the 1960s, just before India launched its first satellite and just after Nehru had created his new universities. My dad is a geek. I am a geek. And it's not just us. Wherever in the world they live, Indians are famous for being swats, nerds, boffins and dogs. I want to know why India is the new superpower and what it means to the world. So, we also have this on the inside cover. India. It's a nation of geeks, swats and nerds. Almost one in five of all medical and dental staff in the UK is of Indian origin. And one in six employed scientists with science or engineering doctorates in the USA is Asian. By the turn of the millennium, there were even claims that a third of all engineers in Silicon Valley were of Indian origin, with Indians running 750 of its tech companies. At the dawn of this scientific revolution, Geek Nation is a journey to meet the inventors, engineers and young scientists helping to give birth to the world's next scientific superpower. A nation built not on conquest, oil or minerals, but on the scientific ingenuity of its people. Angela Saini explains how ancient science has given way to new and how the technologies of the wealthy are passing on to the poor. Delving inside the psyche of India's science-hungry citizens, she explores the reason why the government of the most religious country on earth has put its faith in science and technology. Through witty first-hand reportage and penetrative analysis, Geek Nation explains what this means for the rest of the world and how a spiritual nation squares its soul with hard rationality. Full of curious, colourful characters and gripping stories, it describes India through its people, a nation of geeks. So, let's get started. So she goes to meet Professor Udupi Ramachandra, who is, uh, oh, sorry, Professor Udupi Ramachandra Rao. He's 78 years old, making him one of the oldest rocket scientists in the world. Um, and he tells, tells her how his career began, but I love this because he talks about Arthur C. Clarke, he says, Arthur C. Clarke, he was a great friend of mine, you know, says Professor Rao, catching me scanning the titles on his bookshelf. His office is like a trophy cabinet, lined with wall-to-wall -wall glass cupboards stuffed with honours and awards. Some are shaped like rockets and satellites, another is a plate with his face printed on it. On the shelf behind him, alongside a three-volume collection of his own writings, are books by Clarke, the late futurist science fiction writer and author of the famous novel turned film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Rao is past retirement age, but he still comes to this office at the headquarters of the Indian Space Research Organization in a city to the north of the Vikram Sarabhi Space Center, writing letters and cataloguing his memories. And she tries to define to somebody who's not heard the term before uh, what a geek is. Uh, he has never heard the word before. The problem is, I often have trouble explaining it. Internet definitions range from a person with an unusual or odd personality to someone more comfortable with computers than with other persons. Sometimes people think of a geek as the introvert in the corner of the party, or the comic book collector who goes to Star Trek conventions, or the professor in thick glasses holed up in a laboratory. But to me, at least, geekiness is all about passion. It's about choosing science and technology or another intellectual pursuit, I tell Rao, and de devoting your life to it. History's ultimate geek are the men and women who sacrifice their lives on the altar of science, risking failure to pursue an obsession. She says, um, Computer engineers have overtaken doctors and lawyers in India's social hier hierarchy. In fact, when I tell people that I'm now a journalist, they assume I must have failed my engineering degree. That's like how deeply ingrained it is in the, in the sort of cultural psyche. And she discovers that basically there's a lot of pressure for people to go and become engineers whether they want to or not. Uh, she says, Jawaharlal Nairu had dreamed of building a nation with a scientific temper, with a love of logic and brainy things. He had wanted a rational trained workforce that would slowly lift the country's fortunes. But I get the sense that the reality is now more of a technological dystopia. I haven't seen any signs of creativity and passion, those qualities that lead to scientific discoveries and exciting new inventions. The country may have a booming IT industry, which has attracted millions more young Indians into science and engineering. But the pressure to get one of these lucky jobs is burning out their brain circuits, disabling their imagination and driving hundreds to suicide. They aren't geeks, I think to myself. They're more like drones. So we get some references to the Y2K bug um, and how India came to the rescue. I'm gonna read this out because I think it's interesting. A lot of sort of younger people won't remember the Y2K bug that turned out to be a big nothing, in, pro in part perhaps due to the hard work of all of these Indians, but 
Many decades ago, Western computer designers had come up with the economical idea of not wasting lines of code by, instead of typing the entire year into software programs, just typing in the final two digits. So instead of 1988, they put 88, and instead of 1999, they put 99. Sparing those two digits millions of times over saved countless bytes in precious computing memory and millions of dollars in expensive electronic storage. What they had failed to account for was that by the time the year 2000 rolled around, computer calendars would switch to 00, zero and as far as any mainframe was concerned, it could just as easily be the year 1900 as the year 2000. The problem became famously known as the Millennium Bug, or the Y2K Bug. Governments and businesses around the world went into panic that this temporal crisis might erase bank records, force planes out of the sky and disable nuclear power stations. They needed someone to fix their software. And that's where Indian software companies stepped in. The reference to a guy here, uh, uh, Sahar Sahar had been himself been a student at one of the government's elite colleges, a National Institute of Technology, graduated in 1984. Computers were so rare back then that he completed a degree in computer science without touching a keyboard. Everything he learned was theory. Can you imagine that? Great quote, the mind works like a parachute. Once it's open, it works beautifully. And we get, um, when I see 2020, which is 10 years from now, Simon adds, just before I switch off my voice recorder, you might find the next best application formed in any platform in any technology having an Indian connection or an Indian origin. You might see an Indian invention. But really, I think China's sort of taken over from that, really. That also helps to date the book, you know? And we learn one of the Indian entrepreneurs, um, uh, she asks him what made him a success. And we get, well, I personally feel we have to be humble, he says, adding that this applies to India as a whole. In fact, I was with an Australian group just now, and they asked me what is the secret of what you people have achieved. So I said that it is humility and five other attributes. Murthy tends to list and number his thoughts. He counts each attribute off on his fingers one by one. One is openness to new ideas. Second is meritocracy. Third is innovation. Fourth is speed. And finally, excellence in execution. We focus on these five attributes with humility. The day we have hubris, well... And what's crazy is, um, according to the Association for Democratic Reforms, a new Delhi watchdog that monitors the government, a third of all the members of the lower house of parliament have criminal charges pending against them, including charges of rape and murder. What, what is it with politicians and breaking the law? And we learn about um, the spoken web, so the idea is to create a, a web connection that is entirely spoken, uh, given that a lot of people can't read. Um, we get, you know there are 300 million people in India who don't have a bank account. Most of these people are illiterate and they don't have an address. They can't even leave a fingerprint because they work in their fields and their fingerprints are worn off. How are we going to solve that problem? The conventional paradigm is low tech for the poor at a low price, but we have to leapfrog that. I think some solutions in India will be low tech, but some will be very, very high tech. There's this prism of thinking in the West, Sawak continues. There's this quintessential question which comes up, which is when will India create Windows? When will India create Googles? I think that's the wrong question. Creating a Windows is not our problem. Creating a Google is not our problem. In India, we have other problems to solve. Our problem is our scale. Our problem is feeding and educating a billion people. You need to go to the rural areas and see what it's like. And so she does. And I like this. And I think I work like this quite often as well. It's maybe writers as well as students. There's a joke that sums up how the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi works. And in typical nerdy fashion, it has a technical theory behind it. Students work on the rocket principle, they say. They only get going when their asses are on fire. And we get some work being done to make uh, bananas spoil less quickly. Um, but there's some really interesting stuff here about why they spoil and also why you should keep your bananas separate from the other fruit in the fruit bowl. Bananas are a good test treat for scientists because compared to others, they're particularly gassy. Natural bananas give off so much ethylene, for example, that an apple stored next to a bunch of bananas will ripen even faster than usual as it sucks in its cloud of gas. It's the reason that bananas ruin fruit bowls. The idea is that if you can suppress the production of this ethylene, the spoiling process will be suppressed too. The principle is not entirely new. For years, florists have dipped flower stems in a solution of powdered silver nitrate, which artificially keeps ethylene at bay so the petals stay fresher for longer. But Nate's bananas don't need to be dipped in anything. His team is trying to subtly change the banana's DNA so that it makes less of the rotten gas in the first place. And this bit's quite an interesting little passage where she talks about, I guess, the Indian attitude towards science. Um, I could tell you some horror stories about Indian education, she says. When I was at school, Indian science was taught in this old scholastic manner in which there was no critical thinking required. There was no process of forming a hypothesis and doing controlled experimentations. The critical engagement, you know, asking questions, it was just missing. You could go through science education without ever applying the factoid of what you have learned in your science class to the reality of what you're living in. You just don't. They're two different worlds. You just don't relate, let's say, Newtonian law to miracles. 
But the roots of the problem lie even deeper, says Nanda. The whole business started in the 19th century when we were still under the British, she explains. Indians encountered modern science through colonial education and it was very clear that something quite fundamentally different had emerged in the West, which could be empirically tested and which could be explained without invoking God. I mean, you could explain the workings of nature without invoking any creator God, using theories from Newton down to Darwin. So there we were. We were confronted with modern science. We were studying it. We could run those locomotives. We could see its power and we could see those laws worked. We were attracted to it, but at the same time, because it was brought to us by the colonial power, there was this aggressive defensiveness about India, about our own culture. She goes one step further. Indians have a weird psychology, I think, she adds. With respect to the rest of the world, we have an inferiority complex which we hide in the superiority complex. And this sort of says a lot, I suppose, about Indian culture. In 2008, after a well-known politician claimed that her opponents had been using black magic against her, Adam Aruku attempted to prove that India's new religious miracle makers were fakes. He challenged Pandit Surinda Sharma, one of the country's most famous Hindu musicians, to kill him live on national television. Bald and dressed in flowing white robes, Sharma had claimed that he could strike any man dead in three minutes just by chanting mantras at him. People were so convinced that he might actually do it that audience figures for India TV, the channel airing the show, soared. He recited one verse after another, each one of which failed. Afterwards, the newspapers printed photographs of Edam Aruku laughing. The old magician was standing next to him, furiously chanting in vain. And she writes, It stands to reason that people in rural villages, where rates of illiteracy are high and lifestyles haven't changed for centuries, might believe in religious myths and superstitions. But Nanda told me that, unlike in Europe, where rates of religious observance have steadily dropped over the years as literacy and education improves, India is actually becoming more religious. And she claims that it is in the modern cities, not the rural areas, where rates of religious observance are rising fastest. Clever, wealthy people are the ones paying millions to miracle gurus. And she says, but surely education makes people smarter, not more gullible. And this makes me wonder, maybe Nanda is right, or maybe the opposite is true. Could a portion of this well-informed generation of Indians be attempted to make their beliefs sound more logical and scientific? Not because they believe them more, but because they fear that they believe them less. Perhaps it's an attempt to rationalise what, on the surface at least, can seem irrational. And I think this is a great quote from someone who defines himself as an atheist. He says, I don't believe in a soul. There's this famous biblical saying that God created man after his image in the image of God. A man later said that he created the computer after his own image, the brain, I mean. I would say that man created both God and computer. A recent study by Transparency International revealed that all households below the poverty line in India together pay more than $200 million in bribes every year just to get access to basic services like education and utilities. Nearly half still bribe police officers. The poor are the least likely to have access to utilities like electricity and water. And I think this is quite funny, especially because it's kind of changed since you wrote this due to COVID. Living most of my life in Britain, I've always had a slight suspicion of IT. The promises that were made in the 1990s, that offices would disappear and we would all have computerised workspaces at home, that queues would vaporise as everything went online, never really materialised. Digitising our lives is harder than it sounds. In fact, failed IT projects have reportedly cost the British government more than $39 billion. A computerised scheme to hand out farm subsidies cost $350 million alone and is already obsolete, according to newspaper reports. Plans to issue UK citizens with electronic identity cards were also shelved when it turned out the project would be too expensive. So we learn a little bit about tuberculosis. Um, and I just think this is a fascinating little passage. Tuberculosis is believed to be the oldest infectious disease in the world. Each civilization has given it a new name. The ancient Greeks knew it as Thysis, while a hundred years ago in New York and London it was called consumption. It killed Chekhov, Kafka, Keats and Napoleon. Even Egyptian mummies dating back 3,000 years have been found to carry evidence of the disease. So maybe this otherworldly sanatorium, shrouded in a bleach mist and ringing with the faint ghoulish echoes of rasping coughs, is exactly where a disease as ancient as tuberculosis belongs. Paradoxically though, it also happens to be the site of some of the most cutting edge scientific research into the disease. And that pretty much sums up um, what Saini says about India. Um, overall, Geek Nation, how Indian science has taken over the world by Angela Saini. It's probably her worst book, but then it is her first. It also hasn't aged as well as some of the others, which is a little bit of a shame. Um, but it's still a fascinating read. She does this really great in, uh, like mix of kind of insights into what she's writing about, so in this case Indian science, but also kind of mixes it with travel writing. It makes you feel as though you're going on an adventure with her as you're learning all of this stuff. Overall, I would give Geek Nation by Angela Saini a 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it. That's what I made of Geek Nation by Angela Saini. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.